Jamie, thank you. Deb, thank you. I am not flying because of climate. It makes no difference. I'm, but I'm not flying because of climate change, and then I got invited here. And so as I was being driven to the airport by my daughter's boyfriend, he said, where was that lecture that you gave us about climate change? And you've... I said, well, it's Palm Springs. Um, so I'm happy to report I've already passed out in front of the swimming pool. It's just beautiful. Thank you so much for having me back. And thank you for pulling yourselves away from a beautiful day um, to be here. And thank you above all for listening to writers. I think that at time um, that we're going through now when we're having a lot of questions about identity and politics, this is tough. You know, to, democracy is rocky, it's rough, because you put yourself into public spaces and then you don't know what's going to be said. Um, in 2000, I'd lived here uh, for a few years and I decided it was time for me to become uh, an American citizen, mostly because um, I'm so outspoken, there's a really good chance you just get shoved back to where you came from if you keep going on like I did. Um, and so I had to do this whole thing where you go, I live in Wyoming, so I had to go to camera and uh, make sure that I understood English and could speak and uh, say it. And, um, and then I had to go and get an FBI check and fingerprint, it's quite complicated. But finally we got to go to camera um, Wyoming to be, um, you know, officially made U.S. citizen. So big day arrives, we go down to camera, Wyoming, which used to be the capital of Wyoming. It's no longer the capital of much. And I'm in this <laughs> crowded room. There were about a couple of hundred of us. And the most elevated person they could find to do the signing and, you know, ceremony was the dentist, um, so <laughs> who was next door. And... Um, <clears throat> Sometimes people have, have jumped up and said they know the chap. Um, anyway, he gave the most incredible um, talk, and it stayed with me. It's, I mean, obviously, because it's been uh, now, you know, 20 years. But he said, um, you know, he looked out at the sea of us, and most people were from Guatemala, Mexico, El Salvador. It was me from Zimbabwe. And he said, um, thank you for becoming an American citizen. And he said, because I know that, you know, to leave your motherland and, and is no joke, and that it is your hunger that brought you here. And whatever your hunger is, keep it, because we need it. So if your hunger is because you wanted to worship the way that you felt that you should worship, then welcome. If your hunger is because you want a better life for your family, then welcome. If your hunger is your freedom of speech, then welcome. And I said, yes! <laughs> because I'd never had it. I was raised in, I mean, first of all, British. So, I mean, they haven't had an official emotion since 1776. <laughs> let alone a conversation about it, so there was that. And I grew up with censorship in 1964 when Rhodesia declared itself unilaterally independent from in England. That day, censorship happened in all our newspapers, in all our radios. There wasn't much television. The thing that the editor of, the, of, the, of what was then called the Salisbury Herald did, which was brilliant, was where the government um, redacted or censored news. He, um, he, uh, the editor left it black on the paper. And so when you received your paper, you, there was just black, 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 you know, like, and we're getting there here. <laughs> because if to not have voice is essentially just to have black. Um, and so for me, this freedom of speech, I am incredibly grateful for it, especially because I'm so outspoken. And I mean, I just never had freedom. It was, first of all, I was in under Rhodesia, Ian Smith's censorship, and then Robert Mugabe came along. It wasn't like he was a fan of freedom of the press. And so I, I, in a way, I was very, I didn't think I was ever going to move here. I came to the States um, because of hormones, really. I fell in love. It wasn't that I thought, you know, freedom of speech was going to be here, but that seemed a nice side effect. And um, so I married this American in Zambia, and I moved to Wyoming, and I thought, this is it. Freedom of speech central. This is going to be great, because 
I mean, I knew two things about the United States. You had invented Michael Jackson and freedom of speech, and it sort of seemed, sort of seemed like chicken and egg to me. And I assumed all dinner parties were going to be these robust, you know, everyone was going to really dig in. And, you know, maybe you wore shoulder pads and a helmet so you could really... And I would hobble back from dinner parties with bruised shins because my husband kicking me under the table so violently. And he said, you know, just because you've got freedom of speech doesn't mean you need to exercise it 24 hours a day. So, like, not everyone wants to hear. It might be interesting. He goes, you know what, you're like the nouveau riche of freedom of speech. Those of us who've had it for a few generations. And, and, and that is what I realized. Like, if you have freedom of speech, then you take that other great American tradition, which is the fifth. <laughs> and I don't have that choice, because I have this voice and a life force that came with it. And so I'm outspoken, and I understand, because I disagree fundamentally with so much of what other humans think, that people must, therefore, fundamentally disagree with what I think. But what makes democracy and community robust isn't just freedom of speech, but also the courage to hear one another. And so I... I am so, so grateful for your listening. And if it becomes uncomfortable, I'm even more grateful. So I was always going to be a writer. I didn't have a choice, partly because my mother, who was raised in Kenya, was so glamorous, you have no idea. And because she was so glamorous, and, and she'd been raised around Beryl Markham and, and Karen Blixen and the sort of shadow of them, she thought it would be fabulous if someone would write um, a biography of, of her. Um, because she, always, she could ride horses and she could shoot guns and you know, all that sort of thing. Uh, but she was just too lazy. Um, as she always says, I'm a very lazy person trapped in a terribly active woman's body. <laughs> so, she, so she thought she would outsource the labor of writing a memoir um, to the most pliable person you can, which is an infant. So when she was pregnant with my sister, my older sister Vanessa, she read my sister the entire works of Shakespeare in the womb in the hope that this would produce a literary genius. Um, and it didn't. The upshot is my sister is willfully illiterate. She just refuses to read or write. She doesn't even try and attempt to get vocabulary very accurate. So she really alarmed people when we were growing up by mixing up hijackers and hitchhikers. <laughs> and when she came, and it didn't wear off with age. When she came um, over here to visit me, my mum and my sister came and went, they, my mother, my sister was in her late 20s and came to visit me in the States. And they arrive at Newark. My mother said, oh, your sister. You know, you get those. Anyone here not from here? If you're not from here, you get this form that says, are you now? Have you ever been a terrorist? Do you have a contagious disease? Are you a drug addict? Are you carrying more than a million dollars? Are you a member of the Nazi party? Vanessa didn't bother to read it. She just wrote, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> so... My mum thought it was amazing, because my mother loves men in uniform, grey particular. And she said that, she said it was your, she said that border patrol, he swooped right down on your sister and he had to waddle because he had a gun strapped to every appendage. She thought that was the sexiest thing. And then he got, your sister got dragged into a tiny little interrogation room. There was just one little slit of a window. I pressed my nose up against it, and it was just your sister and a thousand weeping Mexicans. I love this country. <laughs> and you just think, how did I come out of this? I came out of this, though, because having... Fa well, the, 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 my actual favorite part of my sister's inability to nail vocabulary was that when my father, about whom this story is, when he was 69, he announced, right, next year, I'm going to be 70. That's my three score year and 10. I'm not going to bat some other chap's innings. That's not cricket. I'm out. And so he decided he wanted to be buried in sorry cloth, which in Zimbabwe or Zambia, if you're very, very poor and you can't even afford a cardboard coffin, you get wrapped in just black uh, cloth. 
um, which is called sari cloth. Ah, just wrap me in a bit of sari cloth. Now, my mother never has fewer than about eight dogs. So after my dad had thought about this for a couple of seconds, he goes, oh, no, your mother's bloody dogs are going to dig me up. Probably, probably better put a match to me. And then he considered his lifestyle for a minute, and he said, I should be pretty flammable by now. So we all go marching out to this baobab tree where he wanted his, his, uh, flam <laughs> the result of his flammable, um, the match, to be scattered. And um, you know, sort of troop back to the... My parents didn't really live in a house because my dad built it-ish. He just sort of drew scratch some marks on the ground and hauled somebody out of a pub and said, make bricks, put a house there. And so it leans, and the ceiling fan, if it gets going, to, has fallen out, almost decapitated one of my mother's grandchildren. She says she's got another eight or nine or ten. She doesn't know how many, so easy come, easy go. And pythons are forever sliding in. I mean, it really is. Because my mother has this luscious garden. It's a complete snake pit. My sister really won't go down there. But she was down there because my dad you know, was talking about his sort of final days. And so, she, so, so we <laughs> sort of listened to all of this. And then Vanessa goes, oh, my God. You know, when dad dies, I mean, mum's going to be alcoholics unanimous. So that'll be dad. <laughs> and she goes, I, I'm going to be too sad to talk. And... Um, it's going to have to be you, Bobo. You're going to have to do the urology. <laughs> so, <laughs> the long and the short of it is that if anyone was going to write a book, it was up to me. And the world conspired at that point, because when I was five years old, in 1974, um, the Rhodesians, who weren't known for their compassion, thought that trundling kindergartens across mine, you know, landmined roads, dirt roads, from the rural areas into the cities, probably wasn't the kindest thing to do. And so, I don't know how they thought this would be any kinder. They said that all children under the age of seven had to be homeschooled, white children, um, by their parents. So I'm sure that worked out really well for some kids, but I had my mother, and she was still fixated on this idea that someone, someone was going to write a biography of her. Um, so we would get our correspondence packet from what was then Salisbury, now Harare, um, and she, she'd open them up and she'd throw the math over her shoulder, mathematics, she'd go, darling, you always pay someone to count for you, but who are you going to write about? And so um, I couldn't count. Um, in fact, it came as a bit of an astonishment to me at the age of 10 to discover that there was a number such as, for example, 100. And um, uh, so, and, and you know, it turns out if you don't learn to count, really, I mean, this really is a thing. If, you, if numbers are, are erased from your life, for a, if they're a mystery until you're about eight, they never really quite gel. So I didn't have many options. I mean, I was either going to be a writer, or that was it. Like, and then I fell in love with an American citizen, as I've um, explained, and much. He prompted first light. Our whole marriage, of course, like all marriages, was based on a huge misunderstanding. <laughs> and ours was this. He was a river guide on the Zambezi River. He was class five. Like that, has anyone done the Zambezi? Oh, it's like getting flushed down God's toilet. So we did, there wasn't much conversation, honestly. I mean, you're just clinging on. That seemed like very romantic. But the one thing he did manage to tell me was that he was mainline Philadelphia. That was his family. And I thought, oh, thank God, heroin addicts. This is going to be... <laughs> this should go well with the alcoholics. Misunderstanding number one. Misunderstanding number two, when I said to him, I love this land more than I will ever love you, it wasn't a metaphor. I meant it. And so when he dragged me away from Zambia, it was like, I was like, you, you, I mean, you know I'm not, we were divorced 20 years later, it took me a while, but I, I was like, with this, we, I'm not going to survive this, but at the airport, my mother grabs me by the she goes, you're going to America, don't worry, Bobo, there's nothing they can do to you over there that we haven't already tried to do to you here. <laughs> and the really terrific thing is that growing up under, that, under those conditions, so on the front line of a, 
white supremacist civil war. It was our farm, and then there was the minefield that separated Mozambique and um, what is now Zimbabwe. It's still one of the biggest active minefields in the world. Um, and then there was Mozambique, where the insurgents um, were coming over the, the freedom fighters into, Zim into Zimbabwe to liberate it from white minority rule. So we were, I mean, if there was a poster child from white supremacist, I, at the age of six with my Uzi submachine gun, was the poster child. Um, and so there was really this way in which I think I had tremendous capacity in some areas. I'm resilient, I'm a survivor. I also got raised by wolves, like I have no, I don't actually know the rules, I have to, which is great, because if you come to America and you don't know the rules and you have the kind of outsized ego that allows you to survive the childhood I had, you could be CEO of any co company in this country. <laughs> and that huge ego manifested in not one, but five memoirs. I got picked up once by some, um, not picked, I mean, not literally, although that, you never know. But um, I was in Seattle, and one of those drivers, you know, where they take you to the airport, and clearly they, these days, they either need to pick up, because everyone can do Uber, unless you're a drug-addicted pop star or a really useless writer. Like, that's the, just too useless to even have Uber. So I'm that one. So the driver comes and gets me, and he says, clearly, you're a writer, because I didn't look like a drugged-out pop star and he's, yet. And he said, um, so you, what do you write? And I said, memoir. And he's, he said, I mean, one. And I said, five. And he looks in the mirror. He goes, you don't look that old. <laughs> and I said, no, but I'm just remarkably self-interested. <laughs> but the, tr the truth is that if the two rules of writing is to write what you know, my other rule is that to be a writer who's going to say anything worth reading, you also have to court eviction from your tribe. And that is hard, because that's what you know best. But you know, when white supremacists have little white supremacist babies, I think they just assume, Oh, these cute little babies, they're going to stay racist forever, and we can all be friends, it'll be fine. They don't realize that sometimes you have babies and they don't turn out like you. I always, I mean, I am not a very conservative side of the spectrum. I'm not that right wing. I should just, I mean, I know this is a sensitive time, so I'll just throw that out there as gently as I can. But I always feel like at really right wing events, like weddings and stuff, they should trot me out. To be like, right, you guys can get married and you can even have babies, but this might be the result. Like, you can't control what your children are going to be. And I would, this has been the worst thing that could possibly have happened to my mother because, hooray, she raised a writer, but it was me. So when I wrote after, I wrote 10 novels and they were all wildly rejected. Um, in fact, I got fired by my agent, which is technically impossible. She said, you know, you might have a bit of talent, but you don't have a story. And I thought, oh, I do. No, I think I do. And I wrote Don't Let's Go to the Dogs Tonight in six weeks, which was the story of my childhood, but it was mostly a love story to my mother, because you can disagree fundamentally with the way that someone thinks, and you can disagree with their politics, but you can love them. And my mother's the love of my life. That is, there I have no doubt. I was not just bonded to her, I was trauma bonded to her. I wouldn't say it was, I mean, if, you, if there's any shrinks in this room, this is not, sorry, psychologists, this is not the, you know, this isn't the relationship you're hoping for, mother-daughter. We were companions, we were, um, you know, we were sisters in arms. I had an Uzi submachine gun. She, oh, she had an Uzi submachine gun. I would get a smaller firearm. We would get on our horses. I was six or seven. And, um, and years later, um, when we became estranged, and it was so painful to me, I said to an old family friend, oh, it's so painful to me. I'm estranged from my mother because, you know, I was her favorite. And this family friend looked at me and said, no, you weren't. She, <laughs> she, she goes, we're talking about your mother here. She, She's her favorite. She said, you weren't your mother's favorite. You could just keep up. 
but you know, you can accept and love that in a person too. And the thing about Don't Let's Go to the Dogs Tonight was that, I mean, I keep all of my books, I'm accused of being brutally honest, which makes me realize every other memoir is just lying their pants off. I mean, it, it's not even like I'm just to told I'm honest, brutally honest, which lets me know we lie. And I don't know why I didn't get that gene, and neither does my mother. Because she read Don't Let's Go to the Dogs Tonight, and her fury knew no bounds. Um, she said, she read it in manuscript form, and my sister said, I don't know what you've written in there, but if I were you, I'd never, ever, ever come home. I'm like, it's a love story to the woman. Um, so I show up at home, and my mother had consoled herself with a bucket of Bloody Marys. And she was screaming at the cook, Calvin, who had done something wrong, just invective. And she turns around, I walk in the kitchen, she goes, you, you make me sound like a racist alcoholic. And I was like. <laughs> so there is a place in writing where you have to accept yourself, accept the people that you're writing about, write some bigger truth, court eviction from the tribe, be okay with the aloneness of that. And in a weird sort of way, it all worked out because of all the people. I, my father didn't, he said, I don't condone what you write. I don't condemn it either. He goes, just don't do it in public and frighten the horses. Um, and, but we were close. And if I, he never really, you know, he didn't understand. He was, what's the point? You put all these words on the page. And he goes, you wait nine months, what happens? Nothing. He says, you know, I put, seed, a crop in the ground. I wait nine months, you know what? I get a harvest, I get food. I am useful. <laughs> and so this idea of, of being a writer does, never really, no one, you know, it, it didn't make sense. But neither did my father, I mean, neither do my parents make sense. So in a way we just got along in our insensible muddle accepting that. And in f true form, um, my parents, my father loved Paris, it was just, it, it, he had been raised in England, gloomy, the 50s, post-war. You know, all the women were sour because their men and their children had died, and all the women were sour because... And all the men were sour because they had either survived this war and couldn't talk about it. The whole place was a mess. Um, you know, there were strikes, it was gloomy, it was just boiled cabbage, and there was an aunt behind every rock, according to my father. So he went to Kenya to see a giraffe, met my mother, and that was the end of that. And, but as most men of his class and time, they were sent away from England to the continent when they were 18 to go and sow their wild oats, which means what you imagine it means. And I think back in that time, the English were thrilled with the continent because you could go off and behave really badly. And since no one there, me didn't have an aunt behind every rock in France. And most Englishmen don't speak French, they just speak English louder and say, quel fromage, you know, they don't really, it's rather like my sister's English. And, and so for dad, it was this time of liberation. You know, I'm pretty sure that's what Brexit's about, is the English can't wait to be on that side of the channel so they can go and behave badly on the continent and pretend it won't follow them. And there are no Belgians breathing down their necks. And so um, my father was always threatening to go back to Paris on holiday. Um, and then, uh, it turned out, I mean, they were always scraping by financially. Someone told my parents that Budapest was the poor man's Paris. So dad said, right, let's go. So, I mean, they don't tell me where they're going or what they're doing. I mean, they never have. They're not those sorts of parents. They shoved us off at Zimbabwean boarding schools at seven and a half and remembered to pick us up when we were 18, more or less. Um, <laughs> So they aren't, you know, doting in that way. So I get a phone call, not from my parents, but from friends who had been in Budapest saying, your dad's really sick. Um, I'm very sick, and we think someone should be here other than your mother. So I flew over to Budapest, um, and the whole time I was flying to Budapest, I was thinking, God, I hope it's Budapest, not Istanbul. Because, you know, it was just so surreal. And I get there, and there's my father um, in an induced coma, in a communist era crumbling hospital in Budapest. Um, and he, he wakes up from his induced coma and uh, says, Boo Boo, what am I doing in a bus station? I said, you're in Budapest. Oh, 
very unsurprised. And for 12 days, I got to be with him while he died. And it was the greatest gift. That man knew how to die. And that is not something that I think we learn here. I think the English have probably lost it too. In, in, in England, you know, back in the day, they used to say, did he have a good death? Which meant, did you manage to <laughs> punch out with a stiff upper lip and not too much, you know, drama or theatrics? Which is why most Englishmen die on the loo, on the toilet, to be honest. <laughs> um, it's a true fact, actually. And, um, and my mother, who's allergic to cigarette smokes and cats and whatever, that was the other thing about the hospital. There were about 70,000 stray cats in the garden, which my mother named them all, and she fed all my father's food. Oh, he doesn't need it anyway. She fed all his food to the cats. And I got myself locked into the ICU, because the only way I could be with my father, which the, the Hungarians just thought was just beyond the power. I mean, the Hungarians are what you imagine. Those are tough people. They thought this was, they were like, you know, the only people who need to sleep with sick people are gypsies. The gypsies will come in. I said, you know, I'm a gypsy then. Um, and so I hung out with dad, and he, he sort of told me his last things, oh, secrets to life, there weren't any really, sort of seemed. And um, at some point the doctor said, yeah, I mean, they were talking about when he moves out. I could tell he wasn't leaving that hospital. And afterwards I spoke to someone who fought with him in the war and our war had gone on and on, it was a long war. Um, and by the end, men, white men were between the ages of 18 and 60. Um, were all of them were recruited to fight because there were so few soldiers left. So many people were leaving the country who didn't want their children involved in a war. Was, we called it the chicken run, those of us who stayed. And, um, and one person who had fought with my dad six months of every year toward the end of the war, so it was a lot of time in the bush, he said, that was your dad. He said, when, you sh when it would have been more prudent to shorten your stride, your father lengthened his stride. And that's how he went into death. He saw that thing coming and he just, <laughs> he went for the, for the door. And I begged the doctor, call me if he died, if in the night his condition, you know, like in the States, so you can be like in a movie and hold hands and stuff. But they're Hungarian, so he called me in the morning and said he's been dead four hours. And his body's moved to the morgue. Um, and that's it. So at, this all coincided, it was 2015, with this huge pressure pressure of refugees into Budapest. So now I have a dead dad in a morgue. I've got my mother who's coping. As my father says, you should never judge someone who's drinking too much. They just have a lot to cope with. So my mom had a lot to cope with. And I am there sort of trying to hold everything together and the city has shut down. It is just wall to wall, Afghan and Syrian refugees and those people have been through hell. And it, the streets were so packed. I ran to the hospital. I threw my mother in a taxi. And I ran and got there long before her. But I was running against the tide of thousands and thousands of people who lost their land, I mean, their families. Just grief on grief on grief on grief. And I could see it in their faces. And I knew that the only person who would know what to do in that situation would be my father. And my father would have stopped and offered someone a cigarette. And everyone would have been disburdened for a moment and had a cigarette and then light a cigarette. And that would have been that. You know, you're not going to live any longer because you had that cigarette. But that wasn't my dad's point. It was to live better, not longer. To live the most. So <laughs> I managed to get my, my dad to a crematorium where I'm sure he was pretty flammable. They said, oh, we can't do it, you know, it's going to be... I said, he's very flammable. I think you'll find you'll get it done in an afternoon. And so I, I have dad's ashes, and I've got this cardboard box that says, this way up. And I've got my mum in a wheelchair, because she's coping a lot. And I've put on Christian door sunglasses and lipstick, and she's passed out. Beneath, and I've got the hotel wheelchair, we get to the to the airport, and um, I just have to say that one of my most favorite people in the world is here today, who's been a friend of mine for 26 years and who has been there through all of this, and um, who got the phone call from the airport saying, um, my mom can't walk, she's in a wheelchair, you know, we're... <laughs> and it's so funny having um, 
actually having you in an audience as if this was something that was happening to someone else at another time, but it wasn't, it really happened to me. So I'm in there with my mother, I've got her shoved up to the, but Hungarians aren't the friendliest people, I'm gonna go there too. But anyway, so we're at the counter and this guy's going, your mother has to walk on the plane. And I'm saying, I think the European Union would like to hear about that. She's had a stroke, she can't walk. My mother goes, what? <laughs> Top of everything else, I've had a stroke? What, what? <laughs> But she always gets what she wants, and she always gets the most glamorous exit because she managed to talk herself into not only getting carried, I, I, I'm like, she cannot walk, she got carried onto the plane with the equivalent of like the Hungarian Chippendales. Like suddenly out of nowhere, these men arrive that are just gorgeous, and my mother's on me, so I'm like, how? How does it, like if I got so drunk that I looked like I had a stroke, it would not be my luck that six Chippendales carry me on to the airplane. <laughs> like, that's just luck. And also at this airport, God knows why, they don't have a way to get you on the plane if you're in a wheelchair. They put her on with the ham and cheese sandwiches, the lift, bzzz, mum, there's mum. It was, you know, there I am with dad, this way up, human remains. And that part went well till we get to South Africa. Now we're in, it, have, you know, when you go through the security in Joburg, and um, this is how I knew I was home, because I put my dad on the thing, he goes through the security, stop. And the woman looks at me and she goes, you have a bomb. And I said, no, I don't. She says, come over here, look. And she shows me, you have a bomb. And I was like, oh, right, yeah, it does, yeah. Because my mom had chosen, like, obviously the cheapest thing that you could shove my dad in, like a coffee tin, basically. But it did look like, you know, this shape, sort of bomb shape. And then there's all these little ashes and bits of, like, suspicious-looking dental work, I think. what I mean, it did look explosive. And so I go quite loudly, oh, no, 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 it's not a bomb. It's my dad's body. And everyone does this, ah! And I'm like, oh, yes, I'm home. This will do. And so we get dad home, and we, we do the whole scat. Now, my mother is very, very skeptical that I've done all things correctly, because she's like, you know, you're you, I'm me. I wasn't able to, so probably you screwed up. Um, I'm like, no, I didn't. I got this. Anyway, we're shoving dad's ashes under the tree the baobab tree, and the dogs are, you know, racing in after them. They all came up with little ashy noses, and it was as you imagine. And um, suddenly there's a clunk. And I was like, what's that? So she climbs down into the tree, and she, she comes back with dental work. It wasn't my dad's. And we're like, so it's a Syrian, or an Afghani refugee, or it's some unknown, unwanted hunger. Anyway, he had someone. And, oh, it is so us, it's not even funny. And the thing is, my dad would have thought it was hilarious. So for all I know, he's in a crematorium in Budapest. But I think he would, and some poor Hungarians under the tree um, <laughs> by the Zambezi River going, well, what, this is not the Danube. <laughs> so we... Um, we had gone through this life together as a family, the four of us. We had gone through war, we had lost farms, we had lost fortunes. I mean, when I say we lost fortunes, we didn't have much to lose and then we lost that. And my parents kept going, what they had, what they, what my inheritance from them was a life force and humor and a fearlessness. I don't, you know, that has been good and bad because I don't always read, a, I'm very much like my dog. I mean, I know you've noticed that about other people's dogs, but this dog cannot read a room. He just jumps on everyone like, hi! And these people are pushing him off and he just thinks, oh, they want more love. <laughs> I'm a lot like that. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and I like to talk things through. You know, I, want, I don't want to leave stuff on the table. My family's not like that. We joke about stuff, and we'll joke about anything. My mother will joke about her own dead children. She, she is, she, I mean, she has a resilience you can't believe. But you bring up anything real, conversation's over. And with my dad gone, the linchpin gone, I mean, everyone, I think, believes they know who the cornerstone of their family is. But I don't think you know until that person dies. And I think everyone knows how their family will behave. 
when that cornerstone disappears. But I don't think you do until it happens to you. Because having gone through so much, which by the way, I failed to even add this bit, which maybe won't come as a surprise to you. But after I wrote Don't Let's Go to the Dogs Tonight, my mother had such a mad episode. Oh no, it was during. Um, right, right around then, which, which went so mad that she had to get put in a Zimbabwean asylum. And I know. And she says, she says you have to be really mad to go to a Zimbabwean asylum. And she says, and moreover, there's only room in every family for one mad person, and I am taking up that slot. So the rest of us all always have to behave sanely. She says, I have a certificate from a Zimbabwean psychiatrist to prove it, and you don't get madder than that. And which is glorious and wonderful, and it meant that when my dad went, there wasn't enough mental health between the survivors for us to stay together, and we exploded, I guess, as a family. Um, and I, being the youngest and the, the one who doesn't read a room well, kept coming back, but that's, it's going to be okay. We all love each other. It's going to be fine. I might even come and spend six weeks every year so mom isn't lonely. And they were like, oh, God, no, you're so bossy. We don't want, oh, God, no, then we have to stop drinking. And you're always, Jenna, you're going to write books about us. My mother, don't talk. She'll put you in a book. Um, <laughs> and so... Um, um, and so our family, our family blew apart, and it, it hurt me because what I lost with that wasn't just my sister and my mother, whom I loved, oh, but that farm. I mean, you know, the, the life, the life. There's death, but the life is so insistent. And my dad had lost everything, everything, again. And at the age of 59, having lost everything again, my mother's so mad she'd gone to bed. That's it, she climbed under the... When my sister goes mad, she climbs under about 400 cats, turns the air conditioning to North England in winter and just stays there. When my mother goes mad, she climbs under the dogs. When I go mad, I get on a horse and go in the mountains. So we all go mad in our different ways, but... My dad went and sat, uh, meditated, I guess. He, he sat till he ran out of cigarettes. He took a carton of cigarettes, and that was his way of meditating. And he decided, no, he needed to get my mother a farm, otherwise she'll never get out of bed. They, were li they didn't even have a place to live. Someone had given them a cottage where nobody else would live, so far in the bush. So my father goes down to the headman of a village by the river, and he goes there for a year or so, and he begs this headman, uh, please, just a little bit of land. And the headman says, oh, bring me but a size eight shoes. My dad come back with the shoes. It was, like, it was like a fairy story. Then the next week, no, he must come back with a radio. But now the headman's got malaria, so he must come back the next week with the radio. And now you must bring maize, and then now you just need to bring oil, and now you need to bring this and that. And, that. and, my, and, and every time my dad would have to come and sit under a tree and wait, you know, for the headman. Then the headman comes, you always got to be lower than the headman. And the headman always brings a really low stool just to see a white man crouch. He loves that. Dad's groveling, he's like sideways. And finally he said, look, I, I, I'm an okay farmer, but my wife, this woman, can farm. And the headman said, oh, why didn't you say so to begin with? It's yours. He says, I don't like to give land to men. They, don't, they just waste it. Women can farm. <laughs> so... Their dad had this farm that he had nothing. He had a, a reed sleeping mat, a mosquito net, and he was so poor that he qualified for two free donkeys from the Department of Agriculture in Zambia. You've got to be pretty damn poor. You've got to be as poor as my mum had to be mad to get a certificate from the Zimbabwean psychiatrist. So my mother named the donkeys Flash and Lightning, very optimistically, and they cleared this piece of land. Um, my dad at 59, starting again you know, on the ground, and building that farm up. So I loved the farm not just for it, but because for what it, it was and the life that came to that farm and the people who worked on it. And I was writing this book about death and about loss and about how to die well and how to lose well. I think that in this culture especially, there's so much emphasis on winning and getting and gaining and fortune and inheritance. <laughs> Um, I inherited my father's pipe. 
Um, there isn't, you know, there is, we don't learn how to lose well. In fact, to say someone's a loser is a slander. But my father really wore it. When he died, he had everything he owned fit in a tiny little duffel bag. That's it. And I went back to the farm and I lay in his bed. I had to because the spare bed, one of my mother's dogs that had eight puppies on its par for the course. And, um, and I lay on his bed that the carpenter had put together in the farm workshop, just bits of wood, his little mosquito net, his thin little mattress from the market. And I thought, this man was a monk. He got it. He got it. And I was writing out of that gratitude. I mean, even as he lay dying, one of the very last things he said to me is, I've been so lucky, Bobo. But by any distance, this was not a lucky man. He'd married a crazy alcoholic woman. <laughs> he had five children, three of whom died. Um, one a toddler, one a baby, one an infant. He lost, you know, he'd, he'd fought in a war that was a brutal war, and it turned out he didn't agree with the war at the end. He had felt uh, horrified by his participation in that war. He lost farms. He was uh, also estranged from his family. I've been so lucky, Bobo. And I thought, that is the story. And I was writing that um, when the most unexpected and terrible thing happened, which is I have three children, and my middle child, my 21-year-old son, died suddenly. And now everything changes. Because what has been before just a normal grief, which is an expected grief, and a necessary grief. I don't know how you grow up till you lose your parent or a parent. I think it's really hard in this country because everyone's parents live till they're like 100. So how the hell do you grow up? Um, and so, you know, for me to lose a son as I was thinking about uh, very soon after I lost, my father died in uh, September 2015 and my son died July 2018. Um, And I knew, as I was running to his body, two things. I will not abandon my children to their grief the way I was abandoned to mine, because I know the scars that it left me with. I am going to grieve this thing like a Southern African, if it's the last thing I do. And it will be the last thing I do. I will be grieving this till I die. I know that. But the gift of coming where I come from, the resilience of my parents, yay, but also the community that raised me, whether they wanted to or not. Being a minority white settler and a majority first Mashona, then Goba, then Nyanja, Chewa communities, in each of those communities, there is such a lively, real, uh, communication with the dead at all times. That was just in me growing up, even though I then got sent to these, you know, Rhodesian boarding schools, which are quite tough, and, and, and all of, <clears throat> you know, then you're given a very um, amputated spirituality in those places. Ang I'm Anglican, I'm Church of England, Pisc I'm Episcopalian. So you get taught which knife and fork to use, Jesus is not mentioned, I mean, just not. It's just too... Yeah, to the point that I, I live in Wyoming and there are not that many Jewish people in Wyoming at all. So when the, when the Jewish community want to celebrate, they use the Episcopalian chapel for it. And we have a crucifix with Jesus on it up front and everything, but they just throw a sheet over it. So if you go into the chapel during like Yom Kippur or whatever, there's Jesus just um, sort of hanging over you. And I think that that there was this way in which like, you do the burial of the dead and then you're just supposed to get on with it. But your whole heart has been ripped out from you. And what people in my community kept telling me was, oh, you must get over it or you'll never get over it, which are two really unhelpful things to say. But when I told my community in Zimbabwe, their response was, we grieve with you. The first one is the hardest. That's a good thing to remember. I just lost one son. I didn't lose all my children. I'm not 
walking or on some boat bobbing across some terrifying ocean, clinging onto my remaining children. It put my grief in perspective. I don't know that it's made it easier. I don't know how else there is to grieve. I only have my own experience, but I suspect that it did. And so did this, that when my father died, I knew because of the way that I'd been raised and the indigenous people I was raised among, that I had an ancestor above me. That felt good. When my son died, it took me longer to get there, but I have an ancestor there too, a precocious ancestor. And that that gives me, I think, to lose your father, you lose your past. It's gone, your history. At least if you lose my father, <laughs> you know, because we were very much alike. I'm not nearly as close to him or as in love with him as my mother in some ways, but he was, he represented everything that I knew to be stable from my past. When my son died, and he was the one I never worried about, he was so appropriate and athletic and smart and committed, and, and, and uh, I didn't worry about him. When he died, my future disappeared. And so I'm left just here in the constantly replenishing, incredibly difficult present, where I'm not very good at staying, and I need to be reminded, stay there in the present. Because in the present is where the healing is, of course. And in the present is where my son is. And in the present, since the present is infinite and timeless, it's where we all are, all the time, for always. Whether you agree or disagree with one another, none of that matters. We're so divided over what? <laughs> We're all in the present together, <laughs> whether we want to be or not, in that most difficult place. That is all I have to say, but I'm happy to take questions for 10 minutes. If you, um, there's some microphones if anyone wants, otherwise if you just shout out a question, I can repeat. Am I planning to write a book about my sister? Um, no. I've written all I have to say about her. Very loving. You know what? I completely forgot to read from my book. Should I read a short passage? Sorry. I got so... That's the problem with having a huge ego. You just ramble on and on and on. You forget to shut up. Um, I chose this because I thought it might be some of the men in this room too. My father wouldn't have known who Oscar Pistorius was. He died without knowing a single thing about the Kardashians. He had stopped being up to date with British politics after the Falklands, but he wasn't removed from life. He was removed from the stories that swirl around the legs of a life, tripping it up. For example, although he knew very little about American history or pop culture, he had fundamentally understood the place, cut it to its original wound. But racialist, aren't they? He had observed. He didn't acquire information. He didn't see the point of stockpiling facts. The whole enterprise of a 24-hour news cycle seemed to him both pointless and tragically self-fulfilling. Helped by deafness brought on by the war, he had honed his mind to neutral. I didn't realize what an effort it is to stay ignorant, he had said, leaning back and lighting his pipe. You can't look anywhere without accidentally seeing the news. Still, the ancient television was unveiled from beneath its protective dog head covered blanket for the nightly bloody wine, as Dad used to call Sky News, also for Formula One racing and Mum's cooking shows. The rest of the time it sat like a monstrous ancient pet in the corner of the library. Wasps had nest in the works, so it no longer played Mum's collection of beloved video cassettes. But the sound still works, Dad had said. In keeping with this rationale, that a horse, vehicle, or machine properly bedded down for the night lasted longer than one that wasn't, Dad had stored the one and only laptop computer he had ever owned in its original packaging, except on his days for online... Okay, I'm going to use a profanity. Is this going to offend? All right, thank you. Online fucking banking. Then he had, a, he had eased it out of its cardboard box, raised it from its styrofoam sarcophagus, and cradled it down to the pub on his lap. That was the thing. My father made this farm, but at the bottom of the farm, he built a pub. <laughs> Said the farm gave him something to drink for. 
Um, uh, driving over the bumps and potholes with extra caution. In spite of this, Dad's computer had often stalled and it had crashed frequently. Finally, it had died, refusing to produce even the tiniest pulse of light, no matter how many buttons Dad's pushed. It's passed out again, Dad said, showing Boss Shoopy. Boss Shoopy's the barman. A blank screen. It's an old computer, Boss Shoopy had pointed out. Rubbish, Dad said. I've only had it 12 years. He owned socks that were older, he had argued. He had hankies and underwear that had outlived this machine. He even managed to keep a pair of leopard skin slippers since 1963, and that was through hell high water and several hostile southern African border class crossings. Plus, Mrs. Fuller's dogs, Dad had said, and I haven't let a dog near this bloody thing. It's lived in a box since it's born. What's its problem? It was Boss Shoopy's unhappy lot to explain to my father the principle of built-in obsolescence. My father had been shocked. He's very naive, poor dad, Mum had explained afterward. We both are. Very innocent and gullible. My father had mentally dropped anchor somewhere in the early 1950s. He had stopped trying to keep up with mod cons after the invention of the microwave. The startling news that even in his 70s, well beyond what he had considered his natural shelf life, he was likely to outlive his computer, had appalled him. He had been indignant, furious. That's just bloody daylight robbery, my father had protested. Do you mean to say that if I want to do my online fucking banking, excuse my French, I have to buy a whole new computer every 12 years? Who lets these bloody bastards get away with this? <laughs> my father had glowered. I better have another double on the strength of that, Shoopy, Dad had said. Humanity's reached a whole new low. My father had been constitutionally predisposed to hate the word, world of passwords and security codes and computers anyway. There was nothing life-enhancing about any of it, he felt. But the dishonesty of deliberately manufacturing and selling something that was designed to blow up was not only criminal, in my father's view, but also obviously shameful. How does that man manage to keep a straight face? he had asked. He's laughing all the way to the bloody bank. In the end, Dad's unresponsive Sony laptop had been resurrected with some glitches by a Tonga computer technician slash hacker who kept hours in a dusty kiosk in the Churundu market. I left it with Comrade Malambo for the morning, and by the afternoon he had it humming along like a bee, Dad had said victoriously. My father had considered his revived computer a triumph of Zambian ingenuity over Western corruption. I should write a letter to the bloody crook, Dad had said. Which bloody crook, I'd asked. The smarmy one, Dad had said. Dad had considered all computer manufacturers smarmy, but he had focused the balance of his ire on the most visible and vocal offender, Bill Gates. He scoffed at the Gates Foundation pledge to eradicate malaria, TB, and AIDS in sub-Saharan Africa, presenting as evidence for Bill Gates' uselessness the recently defunct Sony laptop. Why would anyone trust that crooked bastard near a cure for malaria? Dad had asked. He can't even do his own job with a straight face, and he's trying to be a bloody doctor now. Well, between giving him the job or Comrade Malumbo, I'd put my money on Comrade Malumbo any day. Then rumors, this is so offensive, then rumors, I won't read this in Seattle, then rumors circulated, confirmed as always by the BBC World Service. The Gates Foundation had donated 50 million towards a mass circumcision campaign in Zambia, and of all places, Swaziland. What did we ever do to Bill Bloody Gates, Dad had asked, crossing his legs and covering his lap with his red spotted hanky. He could sound hysterically distraught when he chose, I'm putting in an order for a chain link cod piece for both Harry and myself. <laughs> Harry's my father's dog. Dad had said, his voice going up two octaves, any other takers, Shoopy? <laughs> Circumcision, hun, Mum had clarified. It's not the same as castration. <laughs> oh, dear God, Dad had shrieked, the family jewels. Run for the gomos, Shoopy, they're coming for the family jewels. My father had believed people who make a killing for a living shouldn't be let out among the general population without proper adult supervision, also not without a leash and a cattle prod. People who didn't touch soil and who didn't have to rely on the genuine forbearance of their fellow humans got unnaturally puffed up, in his view. Dangerously so. It didn't do anyone any good, even the puffed up people. Manufacturing an endless supply of self-imploding computers and getting away with it deferred necessary humility and encouraged a person to take the same flight path as Icarus. Can I do one more question since I have... 
If, are there any other questions? Yes. What was your father's method of dying? How, How did he die? Well, he got pneumonia. Yeah, lengthen your stride. Yeah. And you know, his whole thing, he went to go and see a financial advisor who said, what's your retirement plan? And he said, I'm going to lie naked in a hammock in a malaria zone. <laughs> he just didn't have any interest. In ex his whole thing was, there's no point to being alive it, longer than your shelf life. I mean, he, was, he was neurotic about that. Um, and, he, just, he just never went to a doctor, ever. You couldn't get the man to a doctor. He went once to go and have laser eye thing done. So awful. He said, he said anyway, I'm old. It's like putting new doors on an old car. Bugger it. <laughs> so he just sort of went with it. And I think, you know, I'm sure he could have lived longer, but I don't think he could have lived better. Thank you.